What a boring opening. Sustainable cities. I didn't use any graphics. There's no color because there's no creativity. And if you don't have creativity, you cannot build a sustainable city. My name is Debbie Fisher. I'm an occupational therapist at Manhattan School for Children. We have a wonderful school where children who have physical disabilities learn side by side their typically developing peers. I see some of my students here today, and I enjoy watching you all learn. And I know our school gives you the creativity you need. I bet you I can turn to any one of you and say, can you improve that? And you could. But I did it on purpose, because I want to show you what Bland looks like. These children are special needs children. They are your friends. They are in your classrooms. And they learn with you. And they can do, if given the right supports. And that's what I do, and that's what the team of OTs and PTs do in our school. That means that they work with the teachers, and they meet with the kids, and they analyze the needs of those students so that they can make 3D projects, that they can make posters, that they can stand up here and speak as I'm speaking now. But the best part of my job is when I go into your classrooms, and when I go into the magnificent SunWorks rooftop greenhouse at Manhattan School for Children, because it's there that I really see the magic happen because that's where you all develop critical thinking. That's where your creativity really blossoms. And that's the joy for me in working at our school. You are curious. We need you to be curious. Sometimes you can be a little noisy while you're curious, but that's OK. Our teachers understand that. Our principal is supportive of that, because we look for that curiosity so that we can have successful innovators because we need for you to help us build the future. Many times I'm in your classrooms and I just sit back and I do not do a thing. I watch you think because that's where you develop your critical thinking. That's the powerhouse of creativity right there, problem solving on your own. And when I watch my students, the students with physical disabilities learning side by side and helping you problem solve, I really know that my job is done. OK, so we have this amazing greenhouse. Anybody know what this is? You all study plants and, and insects. Anybody have any idea what that is? Yell it out. Plant? Anybody else think it's a plant? OK. Well, surprise, surprise, it's not a plant. These are actually eyelashes, human eyelashes under an electron microscope. So what I'm telling you is things that might look like you know what they are. And you might say, oh, for sure that's a plan. I've seen that before. I'm here to tell you that you all need to look deeper, that you all need to reflect more on what is presented to you, that you all need to question more and ask and lean into what it is you're trying to do. And don't take it for granted that your teacher is giving you a fact. Turn it around. Look deeper. That's what we're teaching you. This man, Dr. Stephen Hawking, if you looked at him, you'd say, what can this guy do? Look at him. He's all twisted up. He doesn't look like he could speak very well. He doesn't look really comfortable. But let me tell you, this man is a physicist. This man has explained to us what black holes are. This man has explained to us what quantum mechanics are. This man has changed our world. This man in the wheelchair. So the next time you're in class and you look around and you look at your peers who are in wheelchairs or with walkers, or maybe they can't speak very well, or maybe they can't use their hands very well, you need to think of this moment. We don't know who here is going to be the next Stephen Hawking. We don't know who here is going to change it up. But I guarantee you somebody here, and I hope you come back to visit me because I will be here 30 years from now, someone here is going to come back and say, Deborah, I don't know if you remember me. And I'll say, I do. I remember you in class. I remember how hard it was for you to struggle to learn because you couldn't move the way other kids could move. And I'll ask, what do you do now? And they're going to blow me away. I know it. This is the magnificent SunWorks greenhouse on the top of Manhattan School for Children. The people who arranged to get this and create this for us, I thank you from the bottom of my heart because there's no better way for students to learn except by doing. And my students have the chance to really build in this greenhouse. We make 3D projects. We make posters. And we, in learning by doing, as OTs, we know that that gets embedded deeper into your brains. 
It, it probably goes into the amygdala, actually. It really helps you process what's going on, and it teaches you how to think. Anybody have any idea what this is? Okay, I'm wearing it. This is my wallet. That is Velcro. Anybody know where Velcro came from? Any ideas? The man in the corner. His name is George de Mestral. He is an engineer, lived in the Swiss Alps, and one day he went hunting with his dog. And when he came back, he was covered in these burrs. Burrs are up there. They're these sticky things. They stuck to his pants. They stuck to his dog's fur. And because he's an engineer, and because he probably went to a really good school like our school, and the people taught him how to think, and he's curious, he took one of the birds and he put him under a microscope. And what he saw was that there were all of these hooks, hooks, and you could see those hooks right there. And being a smart engineer, he thought, I'm going to look at my pant leg close up. He put that under the microscope. And he said, oh my goodness, material is made of loops, hooks, loops. If I put them together, of course they're going to stick. And so what he did was he took something very organic, something that was in nature, something that was around for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, and he looked at it differently, and he created something sustainable. He created Velcro. And like I said, I use it. Some of you have it on your sneakers. It's incredible. OK, so I'm going to take you back 5,000 years to the creation of a door. It's a big invention. Before doors, nobody had any privacy. It wasn't much fun came out of Egypt. Somebody had the bright idea. Hey, I'm tired of this person seeing me every day. I want a door. Puts up the door, has some privacy. And then somebody said, it's not closing. Every time the wind blows, it pops open. So somebody created a latch. But that's not enough. Somebody else came by. But what happened first was the Centennial Exhibition of 1876. It celebrated 100 years of this country's independence. It was sort of like the World's Fair. It was huge. 10 million people came. This is 1876, so they couldn't take a plane there. They took steamboats. They took horse and buggies. 10 million people from 27 countries showed up at this exhibition. And they were looking at innovative products in all walks of life. And there probably was a booth. You see how it's divided up? There probably was a booth just for doors and doorknobs, because these were new things. And the question is, how do you improve on something that's with us every day? Somebody, two years later, created the first doorknob and door hinge, and he patented it. This is 1878 at this point. Well, doorknobs and hinges have changed a lot in these days. And so now, today, that's the typical doorknob that we have. These are in your homes. We have them all over, and we use them all the time. Except for a small population of people, this doorknob does not work. Maybe you have an elderly relative, or a grandparent, or somebody in your family or in your building who has arthritis. They can't turn that doorknob because it's painful. Maybe somebody comes back from war, and he was a victim of a, of a roadside bomb, and he no longer has arms. And he can't open that door, and every time he wants to enter a room, he has to ask for help. It's not fun to have to ask for help all the time. A little bit is great, but a lot is demeaning. And so somebody thought, what can I do with that doorknob? How can, I, how can I fix that up? How can I look at it differently? And they thought, hey, I'm going to make this. This is going to be for my grandma who has arthritis and can't turn that doorknob. This is going to be for the brave vet who came home from a war for fighting for our country who no longer has arms. This is going to help. But a funny thing happened. Everyone benefited from this. And I know the proof is, if I tell you, well, go home and help your parents with laundry, or help your parents carry groceries, and you've got your arms full, and you have to enter your house, and you don't want to have to put everything down, when you see this doorknob, this lever, you can use your elbow to push it down and open it up. So what happens is, a moment where some group was helping a small group. The design was so brilliant. The design was so simple. It became universal design. And that is a sustainable design. And that's sustainability. So in the future, you all are going to take over from us adults. 
we're going to pass the baton to you. And the reason we push you so hard in school is because we need for you to be smart. We need for you to know it all. We need for you to be creative and curious and inventive. And we need for you to look at things with fresh eyes. And so when we were in our greenhouse, a lot of people think about thinking outside the box. They say there's a phrase, outside the box. But I'm telling you now, stay with me for a moment, and let's go into that big, beautiful greenhouse made of glass on our rooftop. And stay with me in that box for a moment. Because I want to ask you, do you all think that one day some of you might grow up and try to change the world because you were exposed to people, children, your friends who have physical disabilities, do you think you might be creative enough to design a sustainable city that takes those children and those people to heart, that considers how they get around, how they maneuver, how they can access a, a bus or a car or enter a kitchen or go to a movie theater? Do you think you can keep them in mind when you design? Because I'm relying on you to do that. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm just an OT. But I don't know who you guys are going to be. But I guarantee you somebody here is going to leave and fix that problem and make a sustainable city where everyone, people with disabilities and typically developing people, can live in harmony and peace and know that they're cared for by a community. But the only way you can do that is if you ask yourself, what if? So say it right now. What if? What if? And that means, what if I look at something differently and change it up? What if I decide to invent something because even though everybody told me it's perfect, it's not? What if? My name is Deborah Fisher. I'm an occupational therapist at the best school, Manhattan School for Children. We have a magnificent Sunworks greenhouse. I thank you.